Hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk about how we get our skin color, about the pigment melanin, and where and how it's made in our skin. I'm Dr. Katherine Moore, the Histology Wizard. There's extensive variation in skin pigmentation between different human populations. And we know that the variations in human skin color are adaptive traits that correlate closely with geography in the sun's ultraviolet or UV radiation. Measurements of skin color in people throughout the world reveal a continuum of color, as you can see here, ranging from the very lightest to the very darkest. How do we actually classify color? There are several tools for skin color classification used by dermatologists, and a common tool is the Fitzpatrick Skin Phototype, which was developed in 1975. The Fitzpatrick Skin Phototype describes a way to classify skin by both its reaction to exposure to sunlight and the amount of melanin pigment in the skin. And this is determined by constitutional color, so white, brown, or black skin, and the effect of exposure to UV radiation, or tanning. So here are some images representing the six different phototypes. For example, here's a type 1 with pale or white skin that burns easily and tans slowly, if at all. It needs more protection against sun exposure. And here we have a type 5, which is darker skin, that burns less and tans more easily. Though subjective in part due to self-reporting of skin burning or tanning, Fitzpatrick skin typing has a proven diagnostic and therapeutic value. It's been most commonly used to analyze sun sensitivity in population-based and case control studies. So these are studies on skin cancer, exposure to UV radiation, tanning, etc. And skin phototype typing is widely used for estimating UV and laser treatment doses. Now some of you may already be thinking, does this tool have potential to be abused? Do healthcare workers potentially use this tool to describe race or ethnicity? And the answer, unfortunately, is yes. This does happen, and more frequently than it should. Not surprisingly, misuse of these tools has been shown to reoccur more often among physicians who don't identify as having skin of color. So it's very important to keep in mind that providers need to be cognizant of conflating social constructs of race and ethnicity with measurements of skin pigmentation. Now, it's clear that more and more clinically relevant methods for describing skin of color need to be developed. Since there's a diversity of skin color and a range of variations, even within specific populations. So here's an example from a paper where, they, where uh, researchers studied Indian women, and it shows that there are variabilities in skin types from Fitzpatrick type 2 all the way up to type 5. Now, one tool that has potential to be useful for individuals with skin of color is the Taylor Hyperpigmentation Scale. Now, its skin hue choices illustrate increasingly darker gradations, as you can see here on this, what almost looks like a paint chip, and they span the full range of Fitzpatrick skin types. Now, the first question I want to answer today is what gives skin its color? Now, first we need to do a quick review of epithelium structure, since this will become important when we discuss pigment. Now, here we're looking at a cartoon of the epidermis in thin skin, sometimes referred to as hairy skin. Now recall that skin has several regions. This cartoon shows the epidermis and the dermis. There's also the hypodermis, but it's not shown here. Now typically the epidermis is going to contain stratified squamous, keratinized epithelium, and it's divided into four layers. Recall that the layer that's closer to the underlying dermis is the stratum basale, or the basal layer. This is a single layer of germinal cells. These are cells that can divide, and they rest on the basement membrane, which is attached to the dermis. Now this is the layer where most of the cells that make pigment are going to be localized. Next we have the stratum spinosum, so keratinocytes attached to each other by desmosomes on spiny processes. The stratum granulosum, these keratinocytes which contain numerous basophilic granules in the cytoplasm. And finally, we have the stratum corneum. So recall this is the thin layer of dead cells. These cells are devoid of nuclei and organelles. So this layer is often thinner than the other cellular layers and can sometimes look kind of wispy in sections. Now when we think about pigmentation, along with the basal cell layer, we tend to think about the stratum corneum since its thickness can affect pigmentation. But what actually determines color? Well, it turns out that there are four pigments that determine color. 
So I want to use this cartoon as we look at what pigments actually contribute to color. We'll start with the dermis. So in the dermis, we have both oxygenated and reduced hemoglobin, and these contribute to color. In the epidermis, we have exogenous carotenoids from fruits and veggies, and these can contribute, but it's mainly melanin that is the major driver of skin color. Now chemically, there are two types of melanin pigment, eumelanin, which is a brown black and it's insoluble, and pheomelanins, which impart this kind of range from yellow to red. Now pheomelanins are particularly concentrated in the lips, the nipples, the glands of the penis, and the vagina. Now if you take a small amount of brown eumelanin in hair, which would otherwise cause blonde hair, and you mix that with some red pheomelanin, the result is kind of orange hair. So this is what we call red or ginger hair. And pheomelanin is also present in the skin, and so redheads consequently often have a more pinkish hue to their skin as well. Now importantly, it's really the ratio of these two types of melanin that determines skin color. Now epidermal melanins are produced by a specialized cell in the epidermis, which is called the melanocyte, which I'm showing here in this cartoon. And as I mentioned earlier, these are predominantly located in the stratum basale, or the basal cell layer. These melanocytes are going to produce both kinds of melanin. Now before we take a look at the cells themselves, let's briefly review the melanin biochemical pathway. So here's a simplified version of the melanin biosynthetic pathway, and I want to briefly go over it. So first, we can see the two major end products, pheomelanin and eumelanin. And the first step, and the rate-limiting step in this synthesis pathway, is catalyzed by the enzyme tyrosinase. And this enzyme converts tyrosine to dihydroxyphenylalanine, or DOPA. And we're going to come back to this step in just a minute. Now, as you can see in this cartoon, the biosynthetic pathways for eumelanin and pheomelanin are going to diverge downstream of DOPA. And the choice of pathway is actually determined by the signaling activity of the melanocortin receptor, shown here. Now, the melanocortin receptor controls which type is made. And when we block this receptor or block this signaling pathway, we get pheomelanin. So people with red hair mainly present with mutations in the gene of melanocortin-1 receptor. And these mutations actually block this switch from pheomelanin to eumelanin production. So I have a few more take-home points here. First of all, the ratio of eumelanin to total melanin determines skin color. People who produce mostly eumelanin tend to have brown or black hair and dark skin that tans easily. People who produce mostly pheomelanin tend to have red or blonde hair, freckles, and light-colored skin that tans poorly. Now, what do melanins actually do besides give our skin color? Well, they have important physiological functions, including protection of the skin from ultraviolet damage, inhibition of photocarcinogenesis, removal of reactive oxygen species, and they also can affect the synthesis of vitamin D. Now, eumelanin is critical for absorbing UV light. It has better photoprotecting properties, it's got a higher resistance to degradation, and the ability to neutralize reactive oxygen species. Because pheomelanin doesn't protect the skin from UV radiation, people with more of that in their skin have an increased risk of skin damage caused by sun exposure. So pheomelanin is more photolabel, and it may even contribute to skin cancer. All right. I just told you that the enzyme tyrosinase converts tyrosine to dihydroxyphenylalanine, or DOPA, and this is the rate-limiting step in melanin biosynthesis. Importantly, the lack of this enzyme's activity results in albinism, and albinism involves dilution of the color of the hair, skin, and eyes. So with a complete lack of tyrosinase activity, the eyes are blue-gray with reduced visual acuity, the hair is white at birth, even though sometimes it can get yellow over time, and the skin is white and moles are non-pigmented. It's usually caused by recessive mutations, and albinism occurs worldwide and affects people of all races and sexes. So what I'm showing you here in this little clinical pearl, on the left we see albinism um, in, a, in a person with white skin, and on the right, we see the results of albinism in a person with dark skin. Now I want to move on and talk about melanocytes, the cells that actually make melanin. I'm going to talk about their 
embryonic origin, what they look like, and how they produce and transport melanin to keratinocytes. So first up, let's talk about their embryonic origin. This cartoon shows a cross-section of the neural tube at about four to five weeks of development. You can see the light blue neural tube, the dark blue ectoderm, the yellow endoderm, and the pink mesoderm in the middle. Now the green cells represent neural crest cells that give rise to all sorts of cells in the body, including melanocytes. Now these melanocytes are located in various tissues and organs in the body. But in terms of the skin, melanocytes are located in the epidermis and hair follicles, but I'm only focusing on the epidermal melanocytes today. So melanoblasts, which are the precursors of melanocytes, start to appear in the embryo at about eight weeks. They migrate to the skin where they differentiate and start producing pigment in the skin at about five months. Now the transcription factor, microophthalmia associated transcription factor or MITF, appears to be the master regulator of melanocyte identity. And it, it works within a large transcriptional network that controls both the development of melanocytes from the neural crest as well as melanin biosynthesis. So let's have another quick clinical pearl. MITF mutations are linked to Wardenberg syndrome type 2. Patients with this syndrome have hearing loss and striking changes in pigmentation of the hair, skin, and eyes. So on the left, you can see a patient who has a loss of pigmentation in a large patch on the forehead, as well as, as in the hair that's right above that patch. And on the right, you can see the very characteristic bright, bright blue eyes of patients with Wardenberg syndrome type 2. Now, what do we know about epidermal melanocytes? Well, we know that melanocytes reside in the basal cell layer of the epidermis. There's a stem cell population, but the location is not entirely clear. Some studies will suggest that hair cell follicle melanoblasts give rise to epidermal melanocytes, but it's not entirely clear. But like most progenitor cells, melanoblasts are going to lose their ability to proliferate as they differentiate into melanocytes. Now, unlike keratinocytes, melanocytes are long living in the epidermis. They're a very stable population. But like most cell populations, with aging, we do see some decline in melanocyte populations. So we're going to lose melanocytes every decade, and at the same time, we're going to see a decreased ability of those progenitors to proliferate with age. All of this results in skin changes, including pigment changes with age. Now let's look at some melanocytes in actual sections. So here's an H&E stain section showing melanocytes in the basal cell layer of the epidermis, and they're marked here with these black arrows. Now note that these are pretty histologically inconspicuous cells. And so here I've got um, a magnified version, and you can see that, that the cell is kind of oval or fusiform. Now these are actually dendritic cells, and that means they have filopodia or dendrites or extensions, and you can't really see those in an H&E stain. So these cells are often smaller than keratinocytes. And because they transfer their melanin to keratinocytes, the keratinocytes actually contain more melanin than the melanocytes. So melanocytes actually look almost clear. Not always, but most of the time. Now we can, of course, distinguish these molecularly. We can recognize melanocytes. We can look at melanocyte-specific proteins such as tyrosinase or microophthalmia transcription factor, for example. But as I said, what can't be appreciated when we look at this cell that I've marked with the green arrow is we can't really see those extensions or dendrites or filopodia that extend between and contact keratinocytes. And this is a really important feature, structural feature, of melanocytes that's important for function. Now in lighter skin, melanocytes pretty much are confined to the basal cell layer, but in darker skin, they can be throughout the epidermis. So let's look at a couple more sections. In these two sections, you can really appreciate the melanin granules. They're nice and brown and non-refractile. And you can see how they're mostly located above the nucleus and keratinocytes. And again, this is to protect from UV light. Now these next two images show some differences between light skin, so again where you can see the melanocytes in the basal cell layer, as compared to dark skin 
where we see increased pigmentation kind of throughout the layers. Now remember, we really can't tell with this type of stain or really at these magnifications, which of the cells that contain melanin are melanocytes or which are keratinocytes. So here's a few more images where again, you can see the difference in pigment location between light skin and dark skin. So now you can see when we compare the light skin to the dark skin that there's clearly more pigment and more melanin in dark skin but this doesn't actually mean more melanocytes. In fact, melanocyte number is about the same in all skin types. So we see increased melanin, but it depends upon a number of different factors, and I'll get to some of those in just a minute. So we know that melanocytes interact with keratinocytes, and here you can see I've drawn a typical epidermal melanocyte unit where the dendrites of the melanocyte extend between and actually contact the keratinocytes. The contact between those dendritic processes of the differentiated melanocyte and the keratinocytes is necessary for the melanin transfer into the keratinocytes and that of course is what's going to determine the skin color and will be involved in photoprotection. And so the keratinocytes actually endocytose the, mel the melanin. Once it's transferred the mel melanin granules are going to accumulate above the nucleus as we've seen previously and then they actually get removed with the shed epidermal cells. So as our skin sheds epidermal cells, the melanin will have, pigment will go along with it. Now importantly, there's no desmosomes between melanocytes and keratinocytes, and this makes some sense, right? So they're not really considered part of the epithelial sheet. Let's talk some numbers. The ratio of melanocytes to keratinocytes is about 1 to 10, but that's really only in the basal cell layer. So there are actually around 1,200 melanocytes per square millimeter of the skin. Well, what does this actually mean? Well, if we consider that the tip of a very sharp pencil is about one millimeter, this means that if you draw a period at the end of your sentence, there are roughly 1,200 melanocytes that would fit in that period. Now, each melanocyte actually is going to contact 30 to 40 keratinocytes because of those filopodia. And this ratio, this epidermal melanocyte unit, is maintained throughout the life of the melanocyte. So now let's go even deeper and look at the structure inside the melanocyte. So here we're going to actually zoom in and look inside the melanocyte. So here I've drawn a melanocyte and you can see a few organelles, the nucleus, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and the Golgi. And you can also see these dendrites or filopodia or finger-like extensions that are going to extend through those epidermal layers of keratinocytes. Now in the cytoplasm of differentiated melanocytes, we find special membrane-bound organelles. These are modified lysosomes and they produce melanin. They're called melanosomes. Now, I kind of think of these as sort of mobile labs that are making melanin. It's important to have these melanosomes because the biological intermediates of melanogenesis are pretty toxic, so we need to protect the rest of the cytoplasm and proteins, et cetera, in the cytoplasm from those products. So melanosomes are going to go ahead, they're going to produce melanin, and then that's going to be transported to and transferred to keratinocytes. So let's dig into that process just a little bit more. Melanosome biogenesis occurs in several steps, but the key step is the synthesis of tyrosinase, which is necessary to convert tyrosine to dopa. So we start off with stage one vesicles that build inside a fibrillar matrix formed by glycoproteins. Then they get tyrosinase and other enzymes of melanogenesis, and they became, become stage two. Now the melanosome is going to be able to produce melanin, which is going to polymerize and settle on these kind of internal fibrils. And in the last stage, stage four, the melanosome is basically completely filled up with melanin. And so these melanosomes then need to be transported out into the filopodia. And they do this using myosin, dynein, and kinesin motors, and they move into the filopodia of the melanocytes. So again, I think of these as cargo containers, which are now moving on railroad tracks. 
And then eventually they'll contact the keratinocytes and they will be endocytosed by the keratinocytes. And then those keratinocytes will go ahead and unload the cargo and accumulate melanin granules above their nuclei. Now, I mentioned that skin pigmentation doesn't depend upon melanocyte number. So persons with dark and light skin have equal numbers of melanocytes. So what exactly does it depend upon? Well, it turns out that like so many things in biology, this is complicated. We know, for example, that there's more melanin. I've listed a number of different contributing factors here in green. So we can see increased numbers of melanosomes, increased rate of transfer of melanin to keratinocytes, a, a specific ratio of eumelanin to pheomelanin, and there are even differences as I've talked about previously, as to where the melanocytes are found in the epidermis. And all of these things contribute to the amount of melanin. So I've talked a lot about how melanin is made, but not really about how the synthesis of melanin is triggered. So again, this is extremely complicated. There's a lot of different signals, multiple over, overlapping signaling pathways. There are local and systemic triggers but I'm just gonna show you a very simplified cartoon so that we can kind of get the big picture. So first of all, there needs to be some kind of stimulus. So whether that's gene expression, UV irradiation of, of keratinocytes as shown here, or release of, of different hormones, this is going to trigger some kind of response, usually a localized cytokine signal, or sometimes the hormones themselves are signals. And one pathway that these signals converge on involves two hormones, ACTH and melanocyte stimulating hormone. These are pituitary hormones. These bind to melanocortin receptors on melanocytes. Now here's where everything converges. No matter how you get to this step, MITF is a key regulator of melanin biosynthesis. And ultimately, we get more melanin. So again, this is a very complex pathway. It's got a lot of steps. So of course things can go wrong. And when that happens, this can result in uneven pigment production and that leads to skin discoloration. So I wanna first think about what might happen if we overstimulate this pathway. So overstimulation of melanin biosynthesis results in hyperpigmentation disorders. Now these can result from changes in signaling hormones. So hormones, um, melanocyte stimulating factor, UV light, any of these things. We can also have too much melanin from changes in the melanocyte or the melanosome. So basically changes can occur at any steps of the pathway I've just described, including transport. So whether you have overactive melanocytes, a faster rate of melanosome transfer, or just increased numbers of melanocytes, this results in more melanin in the skin. And this can be a localized effect, or more generalized. So let's just take a look at a couple of examples. So local hyperpigmentation can result in freckles or ephylides. So freckles have the, are, are areas of the skin where we have normal number of melanocytes, but there's increased melanin, and these are usually UV exposure related. And so here you can see two examples, one in a patient with light skin, so this would be a type one skin, for example, and one in a patient with dark skin. We also have what are called nevi. So these are basically moles. So in this case, we do see increased local production of melanocytes. So there are more melanocytes in a nevi versus a freckle. And again, I'm showing you two nevi, one on light skin and one on a darker skin. Next, we have melasma. So melasma is an acquired hyperpigmentary disorder, and it's characterized by light to dark brown macules and patches, as you can see on these two examples. And these occur in the sun-exposed areas of the face and neck. So the major etiological factors are, are genetic influence, exposure to UV radiation, and, and sex hormones. So often you'll see that pregnant persons will have melasma. Now you don't just have to have localized hyperpigmentation, but you can see more generalized hyperpigmentation. So one example of that would be Addison disease. So here's a patient with Addison disease where there's overproduction of the hormone ACTH, and this results in significant hyperpigmentation um, of the chest in this particular case. 
So here we see examples of hyperpigmentation. And some of these we might not want to treat, for example, freckles, but some of these we, we may want to treat. So how do we actually do this? Well, there are many ways to actually do it. The simplest way is probably to remove the keratinocytes that have too much melanin. So you can do this physically with abrasion, or you can do, use chemicals such as um, creams that contain salicylic acid or retinoic acid. Now we also can go back and take a look at our synthesis pathway. And here you can see that there could be multiple targets for modulating the production of melanin. So that might be blocking UV rays with sunscreen or blocking the production of hormones. It might be using antioxidants to block the release of cytokines. It may be hormone antagonists, receptor blockers, inhibition of MIT-F, tyrosinase inhibitors, or even blocking the transfer of melanosomes to keratinocytes. Exploring ways to inhibit this pathway is an area of very active research. Now, not only can we ramp up this pathway, but we can also turn down the expression, and this leads to the opposite effect, or hypopigmentation. Now, just as with hyperpigmentation, there are multiple ways to ultimately decrease melanin, from congenitally reduced numbers of melanoblasts, which would result in reduced numbers of melanocytes. We can interfere with pathway steps, again, whether that's through signaling or changes in melanin biosynthesis. We can also change melanin transport or even see increased differentiation. So we can deplete those melanoblasts which will eventually result in hypopigmentation. Now there can also be premature loss of melanocytes. And the classic example of this is vitiligo. Now vitiligo presents with well-defined milky white patches of skin. We call this leucoderma. And here I've shown you two examples, one again in dark skin on the left and one in lighter skin on the, on the right. Now, vitiligo occurs in all races, and there's really good evidence that it's associated with dysregulated immune response. It's not completely understood. And we also, of course, see loss of melanocytes in aging skin and hair. Now, today I've covered melanin, what it is, what it does, how it's made, and what happens if there's too much or too little. Thanks for stopping by.